Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Baiju Political, and I work for Cisco Systems as a customer solutions architect and have been supporting uh, cable service providers um, in United States as well as abroad. Uh, actually, I would be presenting two tutorial sessions on IPv6 technology overview, and this is intended to serve as a primer on the IPv6 technology. I know that most of the folks who sit in this room has got some level of understanding of the technology. However, this will help you um, uh, cover some of the gaps you may have in the IPv6 knowledge, and this is not going to be, going to be a deep dive session, rather it would be a primer wherein we will look across the board all the key aspects of the IPv6 technology at a high level. I have listed down uh, some of the key acronyms um, along with abbreviations. Um, um, I'm not going to go over all these um, acronyms listed here, but this you can always refer to it when it gets posted um, on the Nanoc website later on. Here is the agenda for uh, the tutorial one, which we would start um, uh, in a few moments. Um, we will start with uh, discussing the structure of IPv6 protocol, and in that uh, section, we would have a comparison of IPv4 and IPv6 headers just to find out what are the key differences between the IPv6 compared to the older version, the IPv4 out there. And followed by that, we would get into the details of IPv6 addressing. And as some of you know, the neighbor discovery is one of the uh, foundations of IPv6 implementation. It is very important to understand the ICMPv6 and NIBR discovery at a high level. So we would cover some key aspects of NIBR discovery as well during this first session. And we will take a high level look at uh, the multicast support in IPv6. And also um, we'll do a sneak peek on DNS and DHCP a little more in detail. After the break, at 3.30, we will reconvene at 4 o'clock. And during the second tutorial session, um, I would be focusing mainly on uh, routing in IPv6 to start with, again at high level, um, both IGP and EGP protocols, followed by a couple of tunneling technologies available out, out there as transition strategies. And finally, towards the end of the session, we will take a high-level look at the support of IPv6 over the cable networks, or IPv6 for DOCSIS, and overview session will be there uh, towards the end of the tutorial session, too. Now let us start uh, looking into the structure of IPv6 protocol. Here is a side-by-side -side comparison between IPv4 header and IPv6 header. Even though uh, the base header uh, size for IPv4 is just 20 bytes, the IPv6 header has got a fixed size of 40 bytes. However, if you look at the options defined, right, the parameters it is defined in IPv6, you can see that it is much more simplified compared to an IPv4 header. The reason being, in the IPv4 world, we have had a base header of 20 bytes, and then it could be as long as 60 bytes header based upon the extensions you want to use. So those, those, those extensions defined for the IPv4 was never scalable uh, due to the um, implementation limitations. In the case of IPv6, the base header is always 40 bytes uh, long, and if you want to have extensions, then you can go with the extension headers instead of having the options in the IPv4. So you can have additional extension headers defined after the base header of the IPv6 header. And because of that, um, there is no need for a header length, right? Because header length is always going to be the same for IPv6 header 40 bytes. So as you can see, whatever is highlighted in green has been removed. Uh, header length is no more required in IPv6. Likewise, IPv6 does not support fragmentation of packets by the intermediate routers. If at all fragmentation is required, it has to be done by the originating, um, the source node itself. 
and it has to make use of one of the extension headers which supports fragmentation. And we know that the identification, the flags, and the fragment offset out there in IPv4 are used primarily for fragmentation and reassembly purposes. So obviously those fields can be taken out. And another field which is removed is header checksum. Because when IPv4 was originally designed, not all data, li data link layer protocols um, in, were using the error checking and error correction mechanism out there. And the data link layer was not as reliable as it is today. So there is no need for a header checksum to be in place with the IPv6. So the header checksum has been removed as well. And as you can see, the source address and destination address has been retained. But the major difference is we do know that IPv4 uses 32-bit addressing space, and IPv6 uses 128-bit addressing space. Obviously, IPv6 header requires 16 bytes for source address and 16 bytes for destination address. And now let us take a look at the fields which are retained, but with a different name. The type of service, the concept of type of service to provide different um, quality of service based, uh, based upon the different flow. IP traffic flow is still out there for V6, but that has been renamed as traffic class. And time to leave uh, has been renamed as the hop limit, because we know that even though when time to leave was originally defined with IPv4, uh, typically the way the routers process the time to leave packet is just decrement the count by one before forwarding it to the next hop. So uh, it has been renamed with a more meaningful name, such as hop limit. And the next field, um, as far as the protocol is concerned, uh, we do have something called next header field in IPv6. So the next header field could potentially be pointing to a, either an extension header, right? if you are using extensions with IPv6, or it could be pointing to a higher layer protocol such as TCP or UDP. Any specific questions on the uh, header structure itself? It is pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, um, as far as the IPv6 header is concerned, was the 20-bit flow label which has been introduced, uh, which makes it easier for uh, the source um, as well as the intermediate routing nodes to identify a particular flow. So traditionally in the IPv4 world, we have been using the quantiple of source address, destination address, then the protocol type, TCP or UDP or whatever, and the corresponding port numbers to identify a flow. However, if you have an IPv6 packets with multiple extension headers, so it would be quite cumbersome to um, uh, collect all this information to identify a flow. Instead, the source, right, generating the packet has the option to define a value for this 20-bit flow label, and the 20-bit flow label, along with the source address and the destination address, can be used to identify a flow. And if an application is not using the flow label, then it, the value of zero will be used. Uh, I mentioned about extension headers earlier, and the way it works is if you have extension headers, Right after the base header, which is the 40 bytes header, which we have seen um, earlier, the extension headers will start. And you may have one or more extension headers on an IPv6 packet before the actual payload um, right, uh, starts. And if there are multiple extension headers, there is an order in which extension headers should be placed as well, right after the base header. These are some of the extension headers um, used with IPv6. And if you have multiple extension headers, you have to follow this sequence as well. For example, if you have a hope by hope extension header, what that means is that ex the content of that extension header needs to be processed by every intermediate node with, which are routing the IPv6 packet. And destination options extension header is supposed to be processed only by the uh, IP address, uh, the node 
which is the same as the IP destination address specified in the IPv6 packet. However, there is a difference. If you are using routing header, something similar to the um, loose source routing in IPv4 world, then um, the destination address keeps changing as the packet traverses until it is replaced with the um, final destination number. And in that case, you could have a destination options header which will be processed by the intermediate routers along with the routing header as well. And as I mentioned, fragmentation is not supported by intermediate routers. However, if a source needs to send a packet which is larger than what is supported by the um, link uh, along the path from source to destination, then it can go with fragmentation. And if it does, it will have to use the fragment extension, extension header. And it won't be touched by any of the intermediate routers. And IP, with IPv6, um, the basic protocol itself provides the option to support IPsec. And there are two extension headers defined towards that. One is the authentication header, and the other one is the encapsulation security payload header or ESP header. Then for uh, mobile IPv6 applications, you do have something called a mobility header available. And the destination options header is the one which would get uh, processed by the fi final uh, receiving node, whatever options are defined in the header. And if you have um, ICMP, um, ICMP v6 would be also represented as an extension header. And finally, then uh, what you would have is the upper layer extension headers, which would be TCP or UDP or any other applications, transport layer applications. The minimum MTU size required in IPv6 is 1,280 octets. So a basic implementation of IPv6 is expected to support an MTU size of 1,280 octets. And so as long as the basic IPv6 implementation sends packets at 1,280 bytes or less in size, then it doesn't have to implement path MTU discovery. However, if an IPv6 node needs to send a packet which is larger than 1,280 bytes, then it will have to employ the path MTU discovery to find the, what is the largest possible MTU size it can send from source to the destination via multiple intermediate uh, links. We have seen that the payload size field um, is 16 bits. Um, so, um, what that means is, theoretically, you cannot have a payload size which is larger than uh, 64K. However, if there are applications which wants to make use of a payload size which is larger than what is supported by the payload, uh, payload, payload length field in the base header, you can you have a hop by hop option which supports transmission of something called jumbo grams. Hop by hop options support payload sizes as high as 2 to the power of 32 octets. But I don't know there are any applications today which is making use of that. Any questions around the structure of IPv6 uh, <coughs> protocol before we get into the IP addressing details? With IPv4, we had 32 bits addressing space available, and with IPv6, we have 128 bits address space available. So this is a comparison of how many addresses actually are available in v4 and v6. In v4, we have theoretically a total of 4 billion plus addresses available, but in practice, you know, the usable address space was much smaller because of the way the addresses were distributed. However, if you look at the IPv6, IPv6 you can have a total of 79 trillion trillion addresses. And if you compare it with the 6.5 billion plus population in the world, 
Every person can have 52 trillion trillion IPv6 addresses. So um, nobody thinks the IP we are going to run out of IPv6 addresses for generations and generations. We know that uh, for IPv4 we use the dotted decimal notation, but with IPv6 the addressing format is something called colon hexadecimal uh, notation, because in the case of v4 it is a 32-bit address space, but v6 is 128 bits. And the address representation is called colon hexadecimal, and uh, the 128 bits are separated into 16-bit hexadecimal numbers separated by colons. And you can abbreviate the address. For example, if there are contiguous zeros up appearing in an address, they can be replaced by a double column. However, the double column can appear only once in a single address. Otherwise, uh, the system won't be able to um, reinsert the zeros at the appropriate places. Also, in each block, the leading zeros can be omitted, but not the trailing zeros. Prefix representation in IPv6 is similar to the prefix rep representation what we did with uh, IPv4 with classless interdomain routing. Um, for example, if the, uh, if the prefix portion or network uh, ID portion uses 48 bits out of the 128 bits, then the prefix will be represented as a slash 48. And like the VM, V4 representation, after the prefix ID, the rest of the bits can be, um, you know, you can put zeros for the rest of the bits, which would be abbreviate, abbreviated as a double column. And that is what you see the representation here. And as I mentioned earlier, um, in each block, 16-bit block, you can omit the leading zeros, but not the trailing zeros. Otherwise, it will take out the meaning of the address. Similar to the uh, IPv4 loopback address 127.0.0.1, we have a loopback address out there with IPv6 as well. It is actually all zeros and one, like 127 zeros and the last bit being one. And it is represented as co uh, double column one. So double column one in IPv6 represents the internal loopback address, which is similar to the 127.0.0.1 in IPv4. And as far as the unspecified address representation is concerned, it is again similar to IPv4. In the IPv4 world, we have had 0.0.0.0 representing an unspecified address. Likewise, in IPv6, we have 0 colon, 0 colon, 0 colon like that, uh, representing an unspecified address. An unspecified address in an IPv6 can be represented by a double column. It is nothing but all zeros for that 128-bit addressing space. You will see later on when we cover the neighbor discovery via ICMPv6 that um, this unspecified address is used in some of the applications. Um, for uh, neighbor solicitation um, and duplicate address de uh, detection messages. We do know that uh, the available IPv4 addressing space has been categorized into uh, unicast and multicast. And then with unicast itself, you have uh, global IPv6, IPv4 addresses. Uh, and um, private address space, which any of the enterprises or organizations can use, but which cannot be routed into the uh, internet. Likewise, IPv6 also has an addressing model. Uh, there are three major categories of addresses or scopes for the addresses. One is called the global scope. The addresses with the global scope are assigned by originally by the INA and then the um, local internet registries and to the service providers and finally the um, enterprises or uh, uh, subscribers would get their addresses assigned. 
Those addresses which come in from the global pool or the global scope are globally route, routable in the V6 internet world. And then you have something called unique local addresses. Unique local addresses are something similar to the private address space we have in IPv4. So you don't have to have that unique local address space assigned by um, internet registries, and you can go ahead and pick up and use those addresses in your organization, but it is not routable in the internet. You are supposed to filter and keep those addresses within your organization. And finally, you have something called link local addresses. Link local addresses are used mainly for IPv6 management purposes, especially when an IPv6 node and IPv6 router are undergoing the initialization. And every single IPv6 node and IPv6 router would have the link local, local address, uh, addresses defined for their interfaces, in addition to the global or unique local addresses, because link local addresses are mandatory and link local addresses are used for the ICMPv6, uh, the neighbor discovery, router discovery, even uh, the multicast support, etc. And addresses have a lifetime, typically uh, preferred lifetime and a valid lifetime, and it act actually helps with address renumbering, because at some point, if there is an organization merge, merger or due to whatever reason, the administrator deci decides to renumber the addressing of a few uh, subnetworks, then he can, via the DHCP v6 mechanism or through the auto configuration mechanism, uh, renumber the addressing by advertising multiple prefixes or providing multiple addresses with different valid lifetimes and preferred lifetimes. These are the different categories we uh, covered in the previous slide. Uh, you have the global unicast addresses. And um, for the global unicast addresses, um, the first uh, three bits are always 0, 0, 001. So the next one is a typo. Actually, it is always 0, 0, 001. So what that means is uh, with 0, 0, 001 for the first nibble, right, you add either 0 or 1. So those global addresses always start with either a 2 or a 3. Then you have the link local unicast address. Looking at the prefix portion of the address, you can tell whether an address is link local unicast address or not. And link local unicast addresses are represented by the prefix FEAT colon colon slash 10. It uses a slash 10 prefix. First 10 bits of the 128 um, bit address space is this constant, which identifies the link local unicast addresses. And you have the unique local unicast address. The address space allocated for unique, um, unique local unicast address, which is similar to the private address space, is FC00 column column slash 7. However, uh, the eighth bit after the FC00 um, um, column column slash 7 uh, can be set as a 0 or 1. And the addresses which the organizations can use falls under the um, set FD00 because they make the 8 bit as a 1. And using the 8 bit as a 0 right now is not defined and is not in use. Even though you would see the unique local unicast address is represented by the slash 7 prefix, um, effectively FD00 uh, column column slash 8 is what is being used for, um, by organizations for private addressing. Then finally, we have the multicast address space. And for multicast addresses, the first 16 bits are, are set as 1. So FF00 column columns slash 8 represents a multicast address. The multicast addresses themselves have got different um, scopes, which we will see it later. But um, if you see the prefix uh, starting with FF, then that indicates that it is a multicast address. Any questions so far? Or am I speaking too far? Do I have to slow down a little bit?
As far as the unicast addresses are concerned, it is similar to the IPv4 unicast addresses. It is right one to one. Uh, it is for one to one co communication from a source to a destination. The multicast concept is also similar to the IPv4 world, which is one to many. And I would like to highlight one more um, aspect of IPv6. There is no such thing as broadcast support available in IPv6. So the, you have either unicast or multicast address. So whatever um, functions were accomplished by broadcast in the IPv4 world will need to be taken care of by multicast addresses in the v6 world. And finally, we have something called anycast address. The anycast addresses are typically used for um, uh, some service deployments or locating uh, certain types of services. For example, in your uh, enterprise network, if you have uh, multiple gateways to access the internet, so all those internet gateways could potentially be represented by a single anycast address. So that address w would very much look like a global unicast address. You cannot typically distinguish between an anycast address and unicast unicast address. But the key difference between anycast and unicast address is anycast address can be assigned to multiple interfaces, typically belonging to multiple nodes, so that they all would be providing the same kind of service. For example, a home gateway for the mobile service providers. What the routers would do is, if they have been configured to route the anycast address, those anycast addresses would be identified right in the configuration, and they would forward the packet to the nearest node. So uh, a packet is coming in, which can be forwarded to five different devices, right? All of them are assigned with the same address, but all of them can provide you with the same service. So the, what the router would do is, it will forward the packet to the nearest available node. This is the syntax for the global unicast address. And as we have seen earlier, the first three bits are constant, actually 001. So it can be 0010 or 0011. Then you have the 45 bits which identify the provider. When the uh, registries provide uh, the uh, uh, assign the addresses to the um, providers, typically they provide multiple um, uh, prefixes, um, and um, that would be the provider identified prefix would be uh, 48. Then you have uh, a, um, a network specific address or subnet uh, level address, subnet level address, which you can use to further subnet your network. And eventually you have a 64 bit host portion. Typically, um, with IPv6 implementation, for the host identification, 64 bits are reserved because the IPv6 address space is so huge that there is plenty of room available to reserve the host addressing side. And reserving 64 bits for host portion makes it easier for auto configuration, which we will see it later. This is the representation of unique local addresses. And um, the key here is the first seven bits needs to be constant, as you see here, which will represent the address as a unique local address itself. It can never be routed in the internet. And the eighth bit is um, currently set as one, making it FD00 column column slash eight, actually. And then um, the organizations are free to you know, use the global ID portion for during network, uh, doing the prefix allocation within their network. Uh, this is the representation of link local address. Um, again, the first 10 bits are constant. In fact, looking at the first 10 bits, a node or a router can tell a address is whether it is a link local address or not. So if a router or node receives an address which receives, uh, which begins with FE80, then it is a link local address. Um, with the link local address, only the first 10 bits of the 64 bits portion, right, um, 
uh, of the um, uh, so, um, prefix is defined. However, uh, the remaining 54 bits can be any value, but typical implementations put them all as zero. And only the interface ID will be constructed, and for the construction of the interface ID, usually the UI64 format would be used. A very brief comment. Uh, the 54 bits are probably a bad idea to put anything in there because Several implementations have a habit of sticking the interface ID, you know, the SNP interface ID, hiding inside of that. It's hidden from the user, but if you put it in there, things are going to behave very weirdly. Sure. Th thanks for the comment. Yeah, I agree, because what I have seen so far with the implementations is, you know, they just put all zeros in the 54-bit section, and then the interface ID can be constructed using the EUI64 format. Let's take a look at uh, different scopes available with the IPv6 multicast address. We have seen that the first eight bits, right, all ones, um, represent an IPv6 multicast address, which is FF. Then you have a four-bit lifetime, a four-bit scope. The lifetime can be either permanent or temporary. So if the value is zero, it indicates that the multicast address is a permanent multicast address, and if it is one, it indicates that it is a temporary multicast address. As far as the scope goes, you have different scopes. You have node level scope, a multicast address, which is applicable only to the nodes with multiple interfaces, right? And then you have linked local scope, right? So if, if there is a multicast address with linked local scope, then those multicast addresses wouldn't be forwarded beyond the link. Then you have the site local scope, if the scope ID is 5, it indicates a site local scope. And uh, finally, you have organizational level scope, which is the scope number 8. And actually, the demarcation of the sites will be depend, uh, you know, up to the administrators to define. But as far as the link is concerned, link local scope is concerned, it is very, very clear where it ends. And then globally assigned multicast addresses, would have a scope of E. These are some well-known multicast addresses. FF01, uh, column, column 1 is, represents all nodes, but it has got only node local significance. You would see more of FF02, column, column 1 being used um, in ICMPv6, um, it represents all the nodes within a link. And FF02 column, column 2 represents all routers. It's a multicast uh, address representing all routers within a link. Then you have something called FF05 column, column 2, which represents all the routers within a site itself. And there is one more special multicast address called Solicited node multicast address. So you do have a prefix predefined for solicited node multicast address. Every single IPv6 node which has been configured with an IP address, whether it is a global IP address or a unique local IP address or a um, any cast address is supposed to create a solicited node multicast address as well. The solicited node and multicast address is created by making use of this prefix, what you see here, and combining the last, uh, combining that with this last 24 bits of the unicast IPv6 address. It is mainly used for neighbor discovery and duplicate address detection purposes, which we will see in more detail uh, in the next section. We know that in IPv4 we have uh, a, a IPv4 to MAC address mapping mechanism available, which an, ends up mapping around 24 addresses or so into one uh, Ethernet uh, MAC address. Um, in, the, uh, in the IPv6 world, um, the way the MAC address is created is um, it takes the last uh, 32 bits of the multicast IP address, as you can see, and then add 3333 to it, making it a 48-bit MAC address. So this is the standard 
process for creating a multicast MAC address for IPv6 multicast packets. Solicitation, solicited node multicast address, as I mentioned earlier, are used mainly for neighbor discovery and duplicate address detection messages. And the way it is created is, as you see here, um, it makes use of the well-known uh, prefix, which is FF02, uh, column, column, uh, one, uh, FF02, column, column, one, uh, column, FF, and then it adds the last 24 bits of the unicast address to create the solicited node multicast address. The reason why you have the solicited node multicast addresses out there is if uh, a node wants to send uh, some information or query some information from a different node, right? For example, a, a node A wants to communicate to node, uh, node B. Node A or source knows the destination IPv6 address, right? But it doesn't know the MAC address, unicast MAC address of the destination. How does it come to know? So we don't have an ARP mechanism available in IPv6, so it makes use of neighbor solicitation message to find out what is the MAC address corresponding to that destination IP address. However, the neighbor solicitation message can be sent out in two ways, right? One is you can use the all node multicast address, right? In that case, every single node in the link will have to receive and process the packet, even though only one need to respond, one node needs to respond back, right? So if you use the solicited node multicast address, what the source is going to do is, it will take the destination IPv6 address and uh, convert that into the solicited node multicast address, which is easy to do so because it's a standard process right here, and then the neighbor solicitation message querying the MAC address, actual MAC address of the destination would be sent to the solicited node multicast address. Advantage is even though it is a multicast address, there is only one node listening to it, corresponding to the unicast IPv6 address. We already talked about Anycast. Um, as far as Anycast is concerned, um, you cannot actually distinguish between a, between a global IP address and an Anycast IP address. And I, I don't know whether there are many applications out there which is using Anycast. I believe if you are using um, some of the transition techniques like uh, 6 to 4 uh, uh, tunneling, uh, or 6RD, then in order to advertise um, the border routers, um, any cast address is used in some implementations. There is an any cast address uh, which represents the subnet ID of the router itself. It is called the subnet router any cast address, which has got n bits of subnet uh, with all zeros for the host portion. And then reserved subnet anycast addresses are the anycast addresses which would be used for different applications. And an example given here is mobile IPv6 home agent anycast address. Just an example of how the address allocation hierarchy works. It starts with the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, right? And as we know, for the global addressing space, they are now um, using uh, the first three bit set, right? 2001 column column slash three. And then uh, I now uh, uh, allocates um, the prefixes ranging from slash 12 to slash 23, of course, multiple prefixes to different regional um, uh, NICs. And then the regional NICs are going to allocate the addresses to the service providers. Service providers typically get multiple slash 32 addresses. And when it comes to sites, it would be slash 48. The sites could be even the enterprises which are receiving the addresses from the service providers. And even if an enterprise receives an address with slash 48 prefix, he has got still 16 bits available right, for doing additional subnetting because only 64 bits are used for the host portion of the address. The 
This talks about how do you uh, build the lowest order 64 bit of the unicast address field because the address total is 128 bits and we are only defining in the prefix right um, up to 64 bits. The lowest order 64 bits can be defined in different ways. One is auto configuration wherein you take a the Ethernet MAC address and convert that into a 64 bit address. We will see the process in one of the upcoming slides. And another option is um, randomly generate the host ID. And the third option is manually assign it. Say, for example, if you are using DHCP v6 to do the address assignment, the DHCP v6 can always provide a 128 bit full address. This is how EUI64 format is used to create the host ID portion, right, or interface identifier as you call it, the 64 bits portion of the IPv6 uh, address. So it takes the MAC address and it in inserts um, 16 bits in the middle and it is a constant FFFE. And after that what it does, it does is it flips the universal local bit uh, as um, if it is zero it change, uh, converts to one and if it is one it converts to zero and finally it gets a unique 64 bit host ID portion of the, for the IPv6 address and this is very very helpful when auto configuration is used for IPv6 address assignments. Even if you want to assign global IPv6 addresses to um, the nodes in a network, you can go with auto configuration. And if you're doing that, um, making use of EUI64 for the host portion makes it much easier to implement the auto configuration. Any questions before we get into the ICMPv6 and neighbor discovery section? ICMP v6 is an enhancement to the ICMP which was out there for IPv4 and you do have similar uh, messages, the error messages and information messages available in ICMP v6 as well. Um, in addition to that, we know that in the v4 world we have had something called an Internet Group Management Protocol, IGMP. So there is uh, there is no counterpart for IGMP in IPv6. Instead. Uh, the uh, uh, the management protocol for multicast, the con uh, control plane protocol, has been integrated into ICMPv6 as well. Identified as multicast listener discoveries, we have like version one and version two of that. And the typical uh, ICMPv6 messages are like you have the destination unreachable with different subtypes, uh, whether it is uh, administratively prohibited or the destination network not known or destination node not uh, known, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, time exceeded if the hop count reaches the maximum. And if there is a parameter problem which cannot be identified. And then, of course, the ICMP v6 also supports the ping with the echo request and echo reply messages. We do not have any art mechanism available in IPv6 similar to IPv4. It is replaced by the ICMP neighbor discovery. It is used to um, resolve the layer to link layer address of the destination IPv6 addresses. It is used to discover the availability of routers. It is used to find out whether a node needs to use DHCP v6 or it can go with address auto configuration. And also it helps with duplicate address detection. Continuing into the neighbor discovery, uh, one thing to highlight here is all the ICMP v6 messages are sent with a hope limit of 255. This is to avoid any potential denial of service attacks because if any of the nodes receive an ICMP v6 packet with a hope limit which is less than 255, it indicates that that packet has potentially traversed one hope from somewhere, right? So can be discarded. So the ICMP v6 packets are always sent with a hope limit of 255. And if a packet comes in with 
a hop limit which is anything other than 255, then the node or the router is going to discard that ICMP v6 packet. And as far as the key neighbor discovery messages are concerned, we have five different types of neighbor discovery messages. Router solicitation and router advertisement, neighbor solicitation and neighbor advertisement, and redirect messages. Router solicitation and router advertisement messages are used for, first of all, identifying the routers in the link, and also identifying the prefixes configured for the link. Uh, there could be multiple prefixes assigned to a link, right? So router solicitation and router advertisement can be used to uh, identify those prefixes. And also router solicitation and router advertisement can, will be used to find out what kind of address allocation uh, address assignment mechanism I can use, whether I, ha I have to go with DHCP v6 or I can go ahead and use auto configuration. And then you have the neighbor solicitation and neighbor advertisement, which are used for uh, layer two address resolution, uh, duplicate address detection, and also uh, neighbor reachability information. And redirect is similar to the redirect mechanism we can in, we have in IPv4. If a router re receives a packet uh, which needs to be routed to a destination, and if the router knows that there is another router in the same link which has got a better route, then it can send a redirect message back to the source which sent the packet. Now let us take a look at the mechanism of router solicitation and router advertisement messages. Router advertisement messages are actually periodically sent out by the routers. They are expected to send out these router advertisement messages periodically on all the configured links from that router. The source address would be the link local address of the router. And uh, keep in mind ICMP v6 and the neighbor solicitation and all the neighbor discovery mechanisms always use link local addresses. It could be a unicast address or a multicast address, but it will be link local addresses, because these are not expected to leave the uh, particular link. And if you look at the router advertisement, it sends out a router advertisement with source address, its own address, which is the link local address, and the destination address is the multicast address representing all the nodes. So what that means is the router advertisement messages which are periodically sent are received and processed by all the nodes in the link. However, when a node initializes for the first time or when one of these systems have been enabled with IPv6 on any of its interfaces, during the initialization time, it may not wait for the periodic router, router advertisement message to come in. Instead, what it would do is it will send a router solicitation message so that instead of waiting for the next interval at which the router um, advertisement needs to be sent, uh, the router will immediately send a router advertisement message in response to a router solicitation message. And for obvious reasons, the router solicitation messages will be sent with a destination address, all routers multicast address, because there could be potentially multiple routers first of all in the link, and the source doesn't know the unicast address of the router. So obviously it sends the packet to all routers multicast address. What is contained in a router advertisement message? Different options, subnet prefix for diff, uh, multiple prefixes associated with the link, and the lifetime for those prefixes and the auto configuration flags which tells what kind of address configuration the source needs to use. Here is an example of neighbor solicitation and neighbor advertisement message. We have two nodes A and B which are part of the same link. A wants to communicate with B and, uh, and A knows the destination uh, IPv6 address of B, but A doesn't know the link layer MAC address of B. So what A is going to do is A will send a neighbor solicitation message, and the source address for that neighbor solicitation message would be the A's own address, and the destination address would be solicited node multicast address of B. 
As I mentioned earlier, every single unicast address has a solicited node multicast address associated with it. And as long as source A knows what is the IPv6 address of destination B, the source A can easily build the solicited node multicast address of B. And the advantage of using solicited node multicast address of B instead of a all nodes multicast address is this particular neighbor solicitation message will need to be received and processed only by B because it is intended to, for B anyway. And what is the query in the neighbor solicitation message? A is requesting the MAC address, unicast MAC address, MAC address of B. So as soon as the message is received, what B will do is, B will provide the link layer MAC address to A in the data portion of the neighbor advertisement message. And uh, source is obviously the uh, source, unicast source IP address, right, of IPv6 address of node B. And the destination address would be unicast IPv6 address of A, node A. And this is the layer 2 address resolution mechanism in IPv6. This is what replaces ARP we have in IPv4. This is again neighbor solicitation mechanism used for duplicate address detection. In fact, when a node gets assigned with an IP address, whether it is via auto configuration, that is stateless address auto configuration, or whether it is via DHCPv6, it is expected to initiate something called a duplicate address detection. It is something in the line of reverse ARP trying to make sure that there is nobody else using the same IPv6 address before it can use, start using the address which was assigned recently. So the way it works is it sends out a neighbor solicitation message. However, in the neighbor solicitation message, the source address is unspecified address. The reason being the source address is unspecified address is the new address is still considered as a tentative address by the host A because it hasn't confirmed whether anybody else is using that address, right? Whether there is a duplication of the address. And the destination address would be the solicited node multicast address of the tentative IP address which was assigned to host A. By doing so, by any chance, if somebody else in the link is using the same IP address, he would be listening to that solicited node multicast address, right? And he will receive that and is going to respond back saying, hey, this is my address, right? And um, target address, that is the data field just mentions what is that tentative address, right? Unicast IPv6 address which host A is planning to use. And by any chance, in the extremely unlikely event, there is a duplicate uh, address out there due to some kind of misconfiguration. The host, which is already using the address, is going to respond back. And in the response, what he is going to say is, instead of sending something back directly to host A, which it cannot do, because host A only has got a tentative address, and it used the unspecified address as the source address to do the query, what it would do is it will send the packet to all nodes multicast address in the link so that everybody will come to know that that particular tentative IP address which host A was trying to use was actually assigned to host B. Any questions so far? Ideally, yeah, you could do uh, with an implementation where you can use the solicited node multicast uh, address instead of using the MAC address. But I don't think with the implementations that is the um, uh, best way to do it or most efficient way to be, uh, do it because it is a multicast MAC address, not a unicast address. So it does make sense for uh, the source to send to, uh, into the MAC address of unicast MAC address eventually, right? Sure. Is there something comparable to gratuitous ARP to release an address? Um, or are you coming to that later? 
I don't know whether there is anything similar to gratuitous art in this. Because to release, an, uh, you're talking about releasing an address. To release an address, if it is DHCP, you, have, you can explicitly release the address by using the DHCP release. Because think about it, in the case of um, uh, auto configuration, routers are the one dealing with address assignment, right? Routers are only providing the prefixes. And then the host, right, are going to make use of their MAC address and convert that into UA64 to make it into a 128-bit uh, uh, IPv6 address. So there is no need for it to release it so that somebody else can use it in the auto configuration world. But if it is a DHCP v6 uh, case, if a DHCP v6 server has assigned a full IPv6 address, 128 bits address, and if the node doesn't need that address anymore, it does make sense for it to release it for sure. Okay. Second physical server takes over the static IP of the first server. One way to... We're talking about a VRRP type scenario, I guess. We're talking a VRRP scenario, I believe, yes. Uh, I honestly don't know whether there is a mechanism out there with the neighbor discovery and the auto configuration world for that. Um, any cast addresses can be used for that, but uh, think about this, right? Um, uh, any cast addresses can represent always multiple nodes. So if you are using some kind of load balancing scenario and where you want to provide, right, uh, some information and it can be reached by the nearest node, whoever is serving it. So one option would be to use the Anycast address if, it, uh, if it's applicable. Yeah, but I want my scripts to decide who has the address and not the router. Because, if, for example, if Neiman is down in the box where I don't want the traffic to go, I want somehow to force the traffic to the new box. But I guess I'll, I'll, we just have to find a new method, not try to translate one to one V4 to V6. Right, I agree. And um, think about it, right? If it's router, um, you are fine with because router redirect messages are there. If you are, uh, you know, uh, if somebody is sending to the suboptimal route and stuff like that. But for the particular um, requirement you are talking about, I don't know how can be done with the neighbor uh, solicitation and uh, discovery mechanisms out there today, though. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Kevin Oberman, speaking for the program committee, if people asking questions could please go to the microphones. This is being webcast. The people in the web audience aren't hearing any of those questions. We've had two questions that were fairly long, detailed, and very good questions that when they play this back, they're going to have no idea what they are. So even though the people in the room can hear you, please come to the microphone. Thank you. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Okay, this is an example of uh, redirect messages. Um, this is pretty straightforward, like, you know, uh, what, um, uh, what we have had available in the IPv4 world, too. Uh, there are two routers, R1 and R2, available to the same link, right? And um, node A wants to send a packet to a particular destination, and for as far as node A is concerned, it has forwarded the packet to R2, but R2 knows that for the destination which node A is signed, uh, trying to send the packet, R1 is a better router. So R2 can send an ICMP v6 redirect message. So that for the subsequent packets, node A, so, um, node A is going to use R1 instead of using R2. Okay, here comes the auto configuration. Uh, the cool thing about auto configuration is you can uh, uh, automatically assign IP addresses to uh, the uh, nodes without the involvement of a DHCP v6 server or multiple DHCP v6 servers. The way it works is if the routers have been configured with the prefixes corresponding to a link, 
it could have in fact multiple prefixes so the router will advertise those prefixes right in the router advertisement messages in addition to advertising those prefixes router will convey some additional information related to auto configuration as well and those additional information carried in the router advertisement message will inform the node whether it can go with auto configuration okay i think i was expecting more, some more information around that so those two additional bits are uh, uh, there are two bits um, included in one of the fields with the router advertisement message one is called manage address configuration and second is other um, auto configuration if the manage address configuration bit is set what that means is the node is expected to do a dhcp discover in the case of ipv6 world it will be a dhcp solicit the first packet to receive an ipv6 address but if the managed address config flag that bit is not set what that means is node can undergo auto configuration to get the ip ipv6 address assigned in that case what the node would do is it will make use of the one of the prefixes right provided by the router in the router advertisement message and then it will combine that with the ui64 right uh, interface identifier created to make a 128 bit address then it will go through the duplicate address detection and all that process right and there is the second bit is called other configuration bit even though the host in this fashion can automatically uh, assign an address to itself corresponding to one of the prefixes which is already defined on the router it needs additional information such as dns server list right list of the dns servers and also the domain name etc so even though dhcp is not used for ip address assignment it can be used for the rest of the configuration information so when stateless address auto configuration is used typically the managed address configuration bit is cleared indicating that auto configuration can happen but other configuration information flag would be set saying that you need to do the dhcp to uh, collect the uh, additional information the dhcp options typically uh, dns server list the domain name and etc Uh, if you want to renumber the uh, link the way you can do it is you can advertise as uh, as i mentioned always multiple prefixes right and each of those prefixes have got a uh, preferred lifetime and a valid lifetime and if you have uh, uh, two uh, uh, if you have an existing prefix which you want to de deprecate so you can send out a new ra with the new prefix and for the older prefix you can have the preferred lifetime value zero and the valid lifetime value can, can be a limited value which will expire after some time so obviously when the address reassignment happens the nodes are going to pick up the better prefix which has got um, higher preferred lifetime value and the valid lifetime and um, as far as ipv6 multicast um, service models are concerned um, it is quite similar to ipv4 world multicast world you have any source multicast as well as source specific multicast supported with ipv6 we do know that in order for any uh, source multicast to work we 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 can get it work with either igmp v2 or igmp v3 however for source specific multicast igmp v3 is a requirement in the case of v4 world um, similarly we have with icmp itself we have two um, multicast um, control uh, protocols available one is mld multicast listener discovery version 1 which is equivalent to igmp v2 and then you have mld version 2 which is equivalent to igmp v3 This slide talks a little more about multicast listener discovery. It is equivalent to IGMP in IPv4, and you have to keep in mind it makes use of ICMPv6. It's packaged as part of the ICMPv6 protocol. And as I mentioned, MLDV1 corresponds to IGMPv2 in terms of the compatibility, and MLDV2 corresponds to IGMPv3. 
And uh, the way uh, these uh, MLD, um, um, MLD information will be processed is uh, actually uh, because of the fact that these messages would be sent out, a uh, lot of multicast control messages would be sent out using the multicast group address. In order for the router, right, multicast group address, not necessarily the router will pick it up and process it. It can just try to forward it and, and not process, right? In order for the router to process it, you need to have a um, hop by hop option header where it gives a router alert option. From the router alert option in the hop by hop option header, it knows that even though that multi, it's a multicast destination address corresponding to one of the groups, the router is supposed to process it. Here is an example of a host joining a group using multicast listener discovery. What it does is it sends a report to the group address. And because of the fact that the router alert um, option is included in the extension header, the router will process that and eventually will add that group um, for the link and start transmitting multicast streams uh, destined for that particular multicast group. In this case, H2 also joins the same group, so both H1 and H2 will receive the same multicast stream. And assume that at some point H1 is done with using the multicast stream for any multicast application it is using. What it would do is um, it will send a um, done message to um, all routers link local multicast address. Once the router receives that address, router A will send a group specific query, right? Back to the uh, back to the link to check whether there are any other active listeners to that multicast group. And if H2 is still wants to receive, it is going to send a report. If it doesn't want to um, receive anymore, um, it will not send a report back. And finally, once H2 is also done, and the last very last host leaves that multicast group, and then for the router group specific query. Uh, there won't be any response coming back and there is a router timeout and that multicast group will be removed from that link and multicast traffic corresponding to the, that group will no, no more be forwarded. Any more questions before we move to DHCP and DNS? Just a very high level snapshot. I think I have just one or two slides on DNS. Um, Similar to uh, IPv4, so uh, DNS is important. We need to have name to address resolution. And it is even more important. It's very hard to uh, you know, memorize or deal with those 128-bit addresses, even if you go with the colon hexadecimal notation with whatever kinds of abbreviation you can have. So um, we need to have uh, resource records, RRs, for IPv6. For IPv4, we used to have A records, and for IPv6, we have quad A records. And as far as the pointers goes, uh, we have the pointers for um, IPv6 address also for finding out the IP address corresponding to a name or FQDN. And DNS, as you know, utilizes either UDP or TCP, whether it's IPv4 or IPv6. There are some references listed here if you are interested in going through more details on uh, IPv6 implementation of DNS, some of the RFCs. Like I said, um, as far as host name to IP address is concerned, RR records are represented as A record for IPv4 and quad A for IPv6, and the pointers are identified as the same pointers with the start of authority being different. Now let's get into some of the details of DHCP v6 again at high level. Uh, so far, uh, we talked about uh, 
Stateless address auto configuration, right? The nodes being able to make use of the prefixes advertised by the router to um, assign IP addresses, build the um, uh, interface identifier or the host portion, and then assign IPv6 addresses to themselves. DHCPv6 is used for stateful address configuration. If an organization or if a service provider wants to have control over what IP address gets assigned to which host for management and billing purposes, then DHCPv6 would be the way to go, especially for providers who would assign IP addresses, uh, typically the cable providers who would assign IP addresses to the customers are not going to go with the auto configuration because they cannot track who is getting what, right? So they will have to go with DHCPv6. DHCPv6 um, is similar to DHCP for IPv4. It is uh, much more enhanced. Of, of course, it is out there to support new addressing scheme. And um, as far as uh, the uh, packet forwarding is concerned, it uses two um, link, uh, two multicast addresses, one with a link local scope and the second one with a site local scope. If uh, the DHCP client is trying to locate a DHCP agent, such as either the relays themselves or DHCP servers, then it, will, it can use the link local multicast address, what you see here towards the bottom. And if it is trying to contact a DHCP server, it can use uh, the site local multicast address, which will be forwarded by the intermediate routers too. And DHCP uses UDP with um, well-known ports uh, defined for the client side as well as the server side. DHCP v6 would be required even if you are going with stateless address auto configuration because of the fact that the other configuration information, right, other than the IP address can be provided by the DHCP uh, server. It supports something called prefix delegation. What prefix delegation means is, if the end subscriber is, for a provider, is not a home, or even if it's a home, they want to have multiple addresses or multiple subnets, or if it is a small business, right? Instead of assigning IP address on a per node basis, um, the DHCP server, if it has been configured to do so, and if all the authentication and everything passes, can provide a slash, typically a slash 48 prefix to this small business or a home router. And the home router would have, or the small uh, SMB router, right, would have multiple interfaces serving multiple um, links in their small, home, small office network or in the home itself, right, so that the home router which received a slash 48 prefix can make use of that slash 48 prefix and build multiple slash 64 subnetwork by using separate that remaining 16 bit of the network ID portion. And then it can implement auto configuration locally to assign the addresses. So that is why the prefix delegation is out there. And another thing introduced um, in DHCP is DHCP uses something called a DHCP unique identifier, DUID. So there are different mechanisms to create that one. Uh, different options are given. That is used uh, by the server uh, and the client to track each other. And uh, relay agents are typically involved. And client can use the link local addresses to start with the initial communication. If stateless address auto configuration is available, why would somebody want to go with DHCP v6? And the obvious answer is there are, you know, so many applications and so on out there where it makes sense to know and track the MAC address, I mean IPv6 addresses of the individual nodes, especially if you are a service provider. And it makes much more sense to use the DHCP v6 to do the address assignment in such scenarios. The drawback with auto configuration, as you know, is addresses cannot be selectively assigned. 
And if you want to implement some policies in your network based upon the IP um, v6 prefixes, right, or addresses themselves, then it's going to be impossible by, or near extremely um, difficult to implement it if auto configuration is the method used for IPAV6 address assignment. The stateless auto configuration, which we covered uh, during the neighbor discovery uh, section, is sometimes referred to as DHCP v6 light as well. It doesn't provide the IPv6 address, but it provides the other configuration information. Then you have the stateful uh, configuration, which provides the IPv6 address as well from the DHCP servers. And we already covered the prefix delegation and what it does. We will see more detail in this second half of the tutorial when we talk about the cable-specific implementations. The DHCP unique identifier, uh, DUID, is used by client and server to identify themselves. And the way it gets built is there are three different options. It can be the MAC address plus the time when the ID gets created. Or it can be a vendor assigned unique ID based on enterprise ID. Or it can be just the MAC address. And it will be used in all the DHCP v6 transactions. This is the basic message format. Uh, it uses um, UDP ports 546 and 547. And then the transaction ID can be used to associate a uh, client-side packet with the server-side packet. The transactions, everything happens between the client and server. Here is a nice comparison between DHCP v6 and DHCP v4 message types. We have in the DHCP v4 world the DHCP discover packet, right? That is the very first packet a node is going to send out when it is trying to acquire an IP address dynamically, right? Uh, the equivalent of DHCP discover packet in DHCP v6 is called solicit. And then uh, if all goes well, one of the servers in the IPv4 world is going to provide a DHCP offer. The equivalent of that in DHCP v6 world is advertise. And then we have DHCP request, which goes from the client, if the client is happy with the offer received, right, by the server. And in the, in the IPv6 world, it is also called as DHCP request. But um, you have the renew, which is used for address renewal. But in the case of DHCP v4, it will just send the DHCP request for renewal as well. And the rebind is an extension of renew. For the renew, it is going to contact the DHCP server which assign the address. And if it doesn't hear back from that DHCP server, then it will send it to uh, all the DHCP servers using the all server uh, site-specific broadcast address. That is the rebind process. And the reply comes from the server side to confirm that the address is assigned after the request, which is equivalent to the DHCP acknowledgement from the, in the IPv4 world. Um, release is the same in both cases. Um, An information request is what you would use to find out um, uh, some of the configuration options, right? Um, such as um, domain name, uh, the list of name servers, etc. And uh, DHCP decline uh, is out there in V4 and the similar one in uh, V6 as well if you are declining the IP address. And the confirm message, there is no equivalent in IPv4. It is used uh, just in case a node detects that something has changed on the interface. Maybe it has been powered off and powered back on, or the interface has been disconnected and connected back. So it wants to send a confirm message to make sure that it, the address which has been assigned to the DHCP, assigned to it by the DHCP server, is still valid. And relay forwarder and relay reply messages are integral part of DHCP transaction. Uh, except for the scenarios where the DHCP servers and clients are in the same link. If it is not the case, which would be right uh, in general, then uh, the relay forwarder and relay reply messages are used by the uh, first scope router and in some cases subsequent routers, forwarder routers, 
to encapsulate the original DHCP request packets coming in from the client and then forward it to the server. Uh, we know that um, in the v4 world, when a DHCP discover packet is received by a router, before forwarding it, it can add some uh, information, vendor specific options or whatever, right? Providing additional data to the DHCP server to keep better control over the address assignment and this, uh, the node characteristics. Uh, the way the, in the IPv6 world it is done is, it won't touch the original packet coming in from the client. However, in the relay forwarder, the original packet is encapsulated, plus additional options are added to specify whatever options the router wants to provide to the server. We talked about the confirm message. It is um, used by the uh, client when it, uh, it detects some kind of um, link layer connectivity change. And as far as the confirm messages are concerned, any server can respond back for a confirm message, but that is just confirming that he's in the same link, but it doesn't do anything about the validity of the address itself. Um, then uh, DHCP options, as you know, uh, are very important, right? Um, and it uses 16-bit option numbers with 16-bit option lengths. And some options may be encapsulated in others. Um, when the DHCP uh, solicit message goes, this client is expected to list down the options which it is, which it is expecting from the server. There is something called option request option field in the solicit, which will be used uh, which can, uh, by the client to indicate the kind of options which it is looking for. Some of the options could be generic, but there could be options which are specific to an implementation. Say, for example, if a DHCP um, V6 solicit message is sent by a cable modem, cable modem would need, say, for example, a boot file uh, name and a boot file IPv6 address to download the boot file with the, all the parameters before the modem can come online. So all those option requests are done by using the ORO field so that the right DHCP server will provide the DHCP offer with all that information. And uh, this shows uh, the, um, how the client would come to know whether it can use DHCP v6 or stateless auto configuration. Two bits out there are managed address configuration bit and the other configuration bit. As you can see, the provider edge always have the manage address configuration bit set as well as the other configuration. So um, the clients um, on the customer side should make use of DHCP v6. But in implementations where prefix delegation is used, you have a CPE router, whether it is a small, uh, small office, home office router, or, um, or whether it is a residential uh, router uh, with multiple links, it may receive a prefix through DHCP v6, and it, it can send out its own router advertisement to the local network saying that auto configuration is allowed. If, um, if any of the clients require a prefix instead of a 128-bits address, um, it can request that in the option request option, and then um, uh, provider edge router in, the, in this implementation has to send a radius request on behalf of the user and all the authentication piece has been taken care of. Um, DHCP reply will be received with the prefix delegation options as well. Um, any more questions? Um, I think we have five minutes. If you have any follow-up questions you want to bring up, uh, Hi, this is Dan from Pentella Data. Regarding the prefix delegation, that's an option so that the, in the case of a small home office router, the actual IP of the router's provider side would get delegated as a standard DHCP advertise, and then as an option would be the prefix delegation. Is that correct? Right. So what a uh, small office home office router would do is it will request for typically a slash 48 prefix. And once it receives a slash 48 is the prefix, assume that it has got like four or five local links. So it can divide that slash 48 prefix into multiple subnets, right? Because you have still 16 bits of subnet level address portion. 
and then create multiple prefixes and you can advertise those unique prefixes to those different individual links. Would the, would the small router do two requests then? One for the provider facing um, single IP address and then one for the prefix itself? Um, yes, it will have to do two requests. So that, yeah. Thank you. Time. Are these um, already implemented in the current code of iOS, these options? Uh, prefix delegation, um, actually this is something which is seriously being looked at by the cable providers. Um, I do know that um, in the trial phase, um, one of the customers in Canada, um, I cannot uh, name the customer uh, here, but uh, they have implemented this in the trial, uh, trial stage. Still uh, some of the vendors, you know, the support for it is evolving, but it's out there in the field. But um, I would envisage this becoming a very popular option uh, in the service provider scenario when you are, um, you know, addressing uh, the CPE side. So no current Cisco implementations. Say that again. No current Cisco implementations. Um, is your question like whether Cisco supports? Thank you. I, I think I think some of the UBRs have some. Sniffing for prefix delegation, is that correct? Yeah, you can use the UBR for prefix delegation. The only thing is um, Cisco uh, has not officially started supporting prefix delegation in UBRs yet. But the prefix delegation is supported with other platforms out there, but um, in the next few months the official support would be there, but you still can implement using UBR the prefix delegation for sniffing you're talking about. When a prefix delegation is issued from the small home office router, what tells the DHCP server um, information about that router so the provider can, in, can, provider can log which SOHO router that prefix delegation was sent to? Um, the question is, um, what tells the DHCP server that the prefix delegation can be allowed for that router? How does, how does, the, how does the DHCP server know which end user router has requested the prefix delegation. Because you have an option which you can specify it in the ORO field asking for a prefix when you send the DHCP solicit. Okay. So you can, in the DHCP solicit you can mention that you are requesting a prefix. But then you have to track it by the source MAC address of the SOHO router by the provider facing interface. Right. So um, only the, you, anybody can request for a prefix, right? Only the authorized ones are going to get. So depending upon the implementation, the backend DHCP servers will have the mechanisms in place to pre-provision some of the CP router devices to be, you know, eligible for prefixes to be assigned. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? I think it's um, 3.30, so um, if there are no more questions, um, uh, we'll be c coming back for uh, the second half of the tutorial at 4 o'clock. Thank you for joining and hope to see you for the second session. Thank you.